that is something that I've talked to brothers about my whole life because it becomes like, am I attracted to her because she's genuinely pretty? Or is it because she's light skinned? Or is this featureism? Or is this, and it's like, but then I've been like, well, it's not like I would only think darker skinned women across all racial boundaries are attractive. She took offense to a lot of lines from Kendrick about Drake and and felt like it was an unnecessary shot at people that that were bi, that were biracial that were mixed. Um, I can kind of see the whole colorism aspect. Even even when you see like the most recent one, we talking about not like us. Mm -hmm. Like it's not just that you're not, you know, did you not like us? But you're not black enough. You're not black enough. You don't understand the culture. You don't have a home base. Like it's the reason why he picked that song. It's the reason why it's very West Coast because he's basically saying. I have this sound that I can always go back to, that I'm from, this is where I'm from, where are you from? You can't pull from Toronto, you can't pull from anywhere because you don't have a home base. And not only do you not have a home base, but you also not black enough and, and you're probably a pedo. Like it's all these things kind of playing, <laughs> okay. playing on, laying on top of each other. That's colorism. Is it still a thing? We had the women's version that came out uh, a couple of weeks ago, which is amazing. So I'll leave that linked up in the description below. But I want to jump on this episode because today's guests are phenomenal. I would like to uh, talk to good friends, Michael and Matthew. How are you both doing this evening, brothers? Doing well, well man. Me, man. It's great. It's a good day. It's a good day. I always enjoy these. Yes, for sure. Well, Matthew, can you let everyone know a little bit about yourself before we jump into today's topic? Sure, no problem. Uh, what's going on, everybody? Good evening. Uh, my name is Matt Walker. On social media, I'm King Midas. And I essentially talk about all different types of topics from relationships to colorism. So just happy to be here tonight <laughs> with Sean and with Michael and excited to, to be a part of this. Thank you again. For sure. Michael, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Ah, oh, man, I am I'm Michael or a country boy from the One Mike, One Mike History Podcast. Um, you know, I, I stopped short of calling myself historian. I'm more like a fan. I'm a history buff. So, um, yeah, I, I specialize specialize in Black history, but I enjoy all all types of history, and that leads me to you know end up to a, a lot of pop culture topics and. And things like colorism, because these topics pop up because there's some historical basis behind a lot of a lot of it. Yes, for sure. Thank you, guys. Once again, I, I, I want to jump into this real quick. OK, so I see colorism playing out in this Drake Kendrick thing. Yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So because I was talking to my wife about it the other day and and, and she was talking about how that even plays on us today and 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 with Drake and 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 Kendrick and you know uh some of the lines I can't remember which song it was but he was like I don't want you saying the n word no more and stuff like that and uh I just want to know what did you guys think about this whole beef so far and and do you see colorism playing into this um you know it's funny it's funny you mentioned that because I have um a homie of mine is is biracial. She's um she's black, black and Lumbian Indian. And she took offense to a lot of lines from Kendrick about Drake and and felt like it was an unnecessary shot at people that that were bi that were biracial, that were mixed. Um I can kind of see the whole colorism aspect, even even when you see like the most recent one, when he's talking about not like us, mm -hmm. like it's not just that you're not you know, did you not like us, but you're not black enough. You're not black enough. You don't understand the culture. You don't have a home base. Like it's the reason why he picked that song. It's the reason why it's very West Coast because he's basically saying, I have this sound that I can always go back to that I'm from. This is where I'm from. Where are you from? You can't pull from Toronto. You can't pull from anywhere because you don't have a home base. And not only do you not have a home base, but you also not black enough. And, and you're probably a pedo. Like it's all these things kind of playing, <laughs> playing on layered on top of each other. Yeah, I think one of the things that got lost um, in this specific part of the conversation for the rap battle was that people thought that Kendrick was basically saying because you're biracial, when that wasn't the focus. The focus was 
you were raised by a Jewish mother in a Jewish community your entire life. And Drake has said it himself. You didn't grow up around Black people. You definitely didn't grow up around Black Americans because you grew up in Canada. And so you really don't have a sense of the culture. So you are not like us. So it's less about being biracial because if he was biracial, but he grew up in Memphis with his dad and grew up around Black people and the culture, nobody would have anything to say. That wouldn't be a talking point. You know what I'm saying? In terms of like colorism specifically in this, I think that colorism, you know, for Black men, colorism, it, it, it hits a little different. Right. Um, lighter skinned men are definitely looked at as more soft. Darker skinned men are absolutely looked at as more kind of like rugged and raw, yeah. you know, real black. I've gotten that my whole life, honestly. <laughs> we ain't even going to talk about that. And so it's like, <laughs> I can definitely see how people were, or even, even with Kendrick himself, you know, we're just kind of picking at some of those talking points because we know that people will pick up on it subtly right. and it'll kind of add to, you know what I mean, what's going on and having people be on his side. So I definitely feel like colorism, you know, it was definitely there, let's say. It was wrapped up in a in yeah. a pretty bow with everything else. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Michael, you want to say something else? No, 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 I agree. I completely agree mm-hmm. with all his points with what he was saying. It's basically, you know, colorism was like an underlying layer there. And even if, Neither side said anything. Neither if they, right. if no one said anything, the fact that Drake was is super light skinned and that Kendrick was dark, if they don't say anything about it, the pop culture, the public, black folks would have picked up on it the entire way because we view we view Drake as soft just inherently. Mm-hmm. Like we it, we view him yeah. as a pretty boy just inherently. Nobody has to say anything for for that. It's just ingrained. It's just ingrained in the culture. Are you a content creator, YouTuber? Maybe you've interviewed someone on your video podcast and they said something that was really, really good. Or maybe you said something that was really, really good. Well, enter Opus Clips. This is the platform that I use when I want to share 30 to 60 second video clips that I can share with the whole world. I mean, you can share those clips on TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, uh, Instagram reels, like these 30 to 60 second clips that Opus Clips can give to you with the click of a mouse. All you have to do is upload the recording and boom, Opus Clips within maybe 10 minutes will give you 15 to 25 different clips with description on the side of the video. And it also gives you like a title and it gives you a rating and let you know how powerful that clip can be used on social media from a rating of 99 all the way down to maybe 60. This is a phenomenal platform that has took my social media marketing to another level. If you want to level up your social media game, go in the description below right now and get the link for Opus Clips. This will not disappoint you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I was going to say, did any of you ever uh, witness that in your own personal life, Matt? I kind of heard you talk about that just for a second. You want to uh, expound on that or? Oh, man. I mean, if we're talking specifically, you know, we're talking about like colorism and people being treated differently. Mm-hmm. I've had scenarios and situations growing up where I would be with friends who were even, you know, lighter than me. But in terms of being like harassed by cops and police mm-hmm. or being treated differently where people assume very negative things about me ahead of time. Um, Absolutely, brother. Like it was, and it was just so like, back in the day, it was so apparent, right? It was like right in your face. Like, now you look like you probably did something. You look like you probably, you know what I mean? Type of thing. (laughs) And it just became something that I honestly had to get used to. Mm. And what I did to kind of combat it is mm-hmm. I would try to make myself as non-threatening looking as possible and really being non-threatening from the standpoint of I'm not even really sure what puts people off or makes them feel funny. Mm-hmm. So I'm just going to try to be as non-threatening in the best way that I know possible. But, you know, I'm also like middle school, high school. I don't really have a thorough understanding. So I'm just like, I'm just trying to be nice to everybody so that people don't automatically assume, you know, because even, and that's like outside of the culture, but even within the culture with other black folks, I mean, 
I had friends who were light skinned that people automatically assumed were punks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, like you can't fight, you can't do this, you're not hard, you know, you mm -hmm. soft, like that whole thing. And so it really does play into, and then on the flip side of that, there was almost this assumption that being darker skinned, I'm like this warrior or something. Mm -hmm. Like always ready to fight, always ready to rumble, mm -hmm. always ready. You know what I'm saying? And it would just kind of be like, nah, I'm actually really chill. Um, <laughs> if we don't have to have any altercation, I'm not trying to have like for what. And so that was definitely uh, just a couple examples of things that I've dealt with growing up and just seeing like the colorism play out in front of me. Mm -hmm. What about your experience, Michael? Wow. Um, I remember very vividly and my brother's not even all that light. Uh, I remember very vividly my brother telling me that he was brown and I was black. He was like, he was like, nah. I was like, nah, we about to save complexion. He's like, nah, you're brown and you're black. <laughs> and a lot, I think a lot of that um, led to a bit of overcompensation on my part. I remember very vividly when I was a kid, um, you know, being called white Mike and and struggling with that idea of you know, what, what it means to be black and, and how, how black, how black am I, you know? <laughs> okay. um, yep. Yeah. And, and as I got older, I think I overcompensated a bit, especially in my teenage years, because then, you know, I, I, when I was a kid, most of my friends, I grew up, I was pretty middle-class. <laughs> I was pretty middle-class. As I got older, all my friends were black. You know, I was black. I mean, ultra black. I'm listening to rap, loud rap music. And I just said, these are just stereotypical things, but I wanted to portray this image that I was ultra black, you know what I'm saying? To compensate for this idea that I wasn't, that I wasn't black enough. And it's really very, it's this weird juxtaposition of like, hey, what does it, what does it mean to be black? And how can I look ultra black to people, but in in my head, I'm somewhere in the middle. Like it doesn't like I don't know, color colorism from from you know a darker standpoint, it kind of plays kind of plays with you when you don't fit into the stereotypes that people the boxes that people put you in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think for me, I realized I was dark. <laughs> well not as dark, but dark enough I got roughed up by the police one time. And I was just walking to the store. I never forget. I think I was probably about 20. So this was some years ago. I'm telling my age. Um, going to the store, I'm going to buy some black and mild. So I'll never forget. I came out and this police car just rushed in the parking lot. Three police officers jump out. One's a lady, two guys, and a lady grabs me. I mean, I was shocked because I was like, whoa, right? And they just roughed me up. The other two cops. They threw me on a car and they looking for somebody and they had my uh, I had my wallet on me. So they took my wallet and stuff and they was like, who are you? And they asked me all these questions. And I'm just still like shocked. Like I was just going to buy some. I'm thinking it's black and miles illegal now, right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and uh, they had me roughed up on the car and they looking through my wallet, looking at my ID and all sort of stuff, seeing if I match somebody that they were looking for and come to find out I wasn't that guy. And from no. that day forward, I was like, oh, I can I can really lose my life at any given moment, not just from my own people, but from the cops, too. Mm -hmm. You know, so you that got, was a, that was a lucky. moment for me. I was like, oh, so yeah, you, you got really lucky because, man, they'll pin, <laughs> they'll pin a case on you. Easy, <laughs> easy, right? Easy. And I've done. Anyway, oh, uh, I'll leave that. <laughs> <laughs> Don't incriminate yourself now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, let's yeah let's let's keep it uh, clean. <laughs> Do either of you think colorism uh, itself manifests different for black men compared to black women? Do you think? And this this isn't a comparison, but do you think black men have it harder than black women when it comes to to colorism? Anybody can answer. I, I don't. I, it's it's one of the things I, I try not to do is like compare, compare mm -hmm. atrocities or con compare people's struggles yeah. together. I, I don't want to say think people has any anybody has it harder than anyone else, because it's kind of hard to say what's what's harder than, you know, 
But I will say that there are some very striking differences because if you're a guy and you're darker skin or you're lighter skin, there's there's some you know masculinity that comes into play. Expect expect for me to be ultra to be ultra masculine. They expect for somebody who's light skin to be to be more feminine to be a pretty boy. But for for women, it's this it's this idea that if you're darker skin that you're only pretty for a dark skinned woman and that I'm looking for someone who's light skinned and that real base level paper bag test colorism that we talk about and we think about, I feel like that's the at essence is still there uh, for a lot of, for a lot of women like this idea. I see from guys who darker than me, they're talking about, they look, they, they're looking for a light skinned queen. And that is, that is crazy to me. Like I am a person that that is, true to the point that you should be looking for somebody who looks like your mother. And if she don't look like your mama, my guy, I don't, that don't fit with my spirit. Like, what are you talking about? You know? Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't want to say it's tougher, but yeah. I, I feel like it's like mm -hmm. really, yeah, really I feel like, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I, I agree. And I think that not necessarily harder or not different for sure. And similarities, yes. So difference from the standpoint of women get judged differently than men regardless, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think the colorism piece just adds an additional layer for women in a different way than for men. I'm 42 years old. I thank God on a regular basis that I came up at a time when Wesley Snipes, you know, bust the door down for his dark-skinned brothers <laughs> and allowed us to be great. Because prior to that, I'll be sure Christopher Williams, the rest of the light-skinned brothers was killing it. You feel me? And so when Wesley came through and helped us out, my stock went up. Granted, I was young, but the point is the stock was up. And so I think that there was a definite appreciation for dark-skinned men in the community from, like, I just want my man to be black, blackity black type mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I definitely felt that love for sure. And I don't think outside of maybe before my time, maybe in the 70s. Um, I see a lot more of it now, but I think, I don't know if I've seen that same type of situation happen for darker skinned black women. I think that they have gotten a lot, they get a lot of ridicule from, especially, they get more ridicule, especially because of their hair as well, because typically with darker skin comes a more coarse texture for the hair. Right. And so it just, it kind of piles on differently for them, right? And I have seen people treat lighter skinned women better for whatever reason. And it had to be kind of pointed out to me to right. an extent to really like pay attention to see how they were treated differently. But it was weird at the same time, but it's something that I've noticed honestly, since I was like in high school. And so I don't, I would say that we have different struggles because I also feel like in certain arenas, again, just being a black man, I have absolutely been treated a certain kind of way because I'm black and I'm a man. Right. And I've been with women in situations where they didn't get treated like that at all. Dark light, it didn't matter because mm -hmm. they were women. Right. And so it just That's really true. depends on kind of like the arena, you know what I mean? But if we're saying like within the community, yeah, man, it, it affects us differently. And I think it's important for us as brothers to make sure that we acknowledge when the sisters are talking to us about it and how some of our actions, unbeknownst to ourselves, really do affect women across the board. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's funny you mentioned that because like even within myself, mm -hmm. I kind of like think about my taste, the women, the people that I had celebrity mm -hmm. crushes on, the people that I that I like, oh man. Like like you look at somebody like like Holly Berry or yeah. like even in the 80s, like all the women that Prince liked or the women of Ray Dong. Talk Trump, about it. All the women that right. were all, e. all light skinned. Mm -hmm. They were all like racially ambiguous. And it's yep. just, I, I, I don't know if that like molded how I look at women, but I distinctly remember having a huge crush on Maya. And I don't know if that's because she was light skinned. Well, I mean, she's gorgeous. So. <laughs> she is that's gorgeous. another conversation. <laughs> that is. <laughs> <laughs> but I understand. But that is, but it's so interesting that you say that, Michael, because that is something that I've talked to brothers about my whole life because it becomes like, am I attracted to her because she's genuinely pretty? Or mm. is it because she's light skinned? Or is this featurism? Or is this, 
And it's yeah. like, but then I've been like, well, it's not like I would only think darker skinned women across all racial ba- boundaries are attractive. And anyone who's not dark skinned is not attractive. Mm, right, right. You know, and so it's like, but even with what you said, it's like it becomes this thing where you really kind of take a step back and break it down. Like, man, what, it has this really affected me maybe more than I realized, at least in certain right. instances. Right. You know? mm-hmm. And I'm cognizant of it. So just imagine if yeah. you weren't like I'm aware and I still. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's real, because even when I was talking to the ladies, uh, two of the ladies were, were, were light skinned and mm-hmm. one of them were saying that <clears throat> she's like, don't forget, we we get the the short end of the stick sometimes too because a lot of guys think that we're bougie and that we we stuck up and you know it it it's it's like this certain kind of looking down on people because I am lighter skin like you know these privileges just like we 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 catch it too you know we automatically get that oh she's not cool it's like light skin girls aren't cool or you know they yeah. they just like pristine and 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 right. and, and the dark skin girls are the homies right 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 you they're know? rugged they're yeah. rugged they'll fight for you <laughs> yeah fight for you. right yeah. right yeah. yeah it's like it's almost like they're more down for the struggle if you will right to, right yeah you know? uh uh which is sad and I wanted to talk about this because Michael I'm glad you brought this up even with like with women and stuff like that because I remember growing up and I was crazy about Felicia Rashad. Yeah. I was I was crazy oh. about Sheila E. And yeah. and and all these even like you say nineties Maya and, and all yeah. these women, you know, right? Yeah. And I I was talking on the the last episode about my mom is like almost like a caramel complexion, right? My mom. Yeah. My ex wife, same complexion. I remarried, went through a divorce, remarried. My wife, same complexion, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? So I didn't think about this until uh, I was talking to my wife a, a couple of weeks ago. And I was just like, am I color struck? You know, mm-hmm. and, and the funny thing about it is with dark skinned women, they have been nothing but queens to me. I, I can't say anything bad about any dark skinned woman I've encountered. They have treated me like, a king yet and still i didn't get with a dark skin sister I, she she was more of a, a caramel complexion so i i don't know if like like you said matt is it a, a beauty thing or was i looking at the color yeah that's a tough one <laughs> i think that's going to be individual right like i know i i ain't gonna lie to you when i got married um i'm divorced now but when i got married it was definitely something that was on my mind. I was like, because my mom is brown skin, mm-hmm. not as dark as I am, just a little lighter, not not anything. And my family's Jamaican. And I've talked to her about this. And she's like, I'm not light skinned in Jamaica, so I don't consider myself lighter in gem. That's just not how she grew up or whatever. And yeah. so my ex-wife, though, was the exact same complexion as she is, same height and everything. Mm-hmm. And it was just interesting to me because I... I will be honest and say that I absolutely wanted, I wanted black kids, you know? I wanted kids that phenotypically looked black. And I don't know. I think that it does affect us subconsciously. Um, It's affected like the women I've dated in my life, just in general. I typically only dated black women, brown or darker skinned, um women but i can honestly say some of that was purposeful too Mm. i've thought about it more um recently you know coming out of a marriage and getting back on the dating scene because now it's so strange the only women that approach me now are lighter skin only only and it's just it's completely throwing me off because i'm not used to that you know what i mean so is it because though and uh, and, and in the last interview, I talked to the ladies about that because they were all single. And I said, what is your dating preference? They was like, chocolate, 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 chocolate. <laughs> like that that was the answer. That was the that was the roar, you know. So mm-hmm. maybe is is it because, you know, chocolate is in that you're, you're like the hot commodity now? I think I think it's definitely I think that's definitely part of it. Yeah. yeah. 
I do. Yeah. But I think it also kind of plays into what we were talking about before, though, right? The stereotype mm -hmm. from, I think there's a preference there, but trust me, I've had enough women talk to me about my complexion and the things that they like about it in my lifetime, where I know that some of it is also, it makes people feel safe and it makes women feel like connected to blackness in some strange way. <laughs> like you'd be shocked at some of the conversations I've had over the years. That's wild to me. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. I'm so out. I'm so out of touch, man. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what you got. I, I live vicariously through single people when they tell me what, what it's like out there. <laughs> yeah. Cause I was going to ask you, Michael, what is, I, I think you might've talked about it. Like what has been your experience as far as past and your past and dating and stuff? Like, has it always been like this one color of tone or has there been like a spectrum? Um, Honestly, it's, I mean, it's, I've never dated anything other than black women. I always knew that that was like, um, <laughs> it's funny you mentioned it. I'm going to tell a short, a short story because when I was, man, fifth grade, fourth grade, I remember I got a Valentine from a little white girl and I remember my mom, she saw it and she, and I distinctly remember to this day, her being like, Mikey be like it to, to marry a white woman. And I was like, Nah, <laughs> I remember this in my head. I remember it like it was yesterday. So yeah. when she said that, I was like, nah. And I don't know. Like, like I said, I, it was some. I, I think it might be attempting my and, and you know subconsciously to be like ultra black or to prove her wrong. But I've only dated black women since since then. And and you know, I don't really think, especially when I was younger, um, that I was trying to pick a tone or. Uh, or or anything. I was really like my dad told me when I was little, hey, like who like you, and and if she, whatever she not whatever she looked like, but like oh yeah, you're attractive and you like me. Those are two things that that's all I need. Like I'm not looking for a color. I'm looking for somebody who like me. Right. So that ended up with me dating like a, a gamut because you know, and I I didn't I haven't mentioned this, but my my wife's dark skin. My wife is darker. She's darker than me. You know what I'm saying? But her complexion is like, which, which I love. It's not like she has other features that I love more than her being light skin or dark skin. Like she's tall and she got long legs and that. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, now that. Yeah, that, that, there something. we go. That's what I like. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, it has nothing to yeah, do with color. As opposed to complexion, right. that's other things that I, that I enjoy about her. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. No, and I think it's important too to remember that the colorism aspect of things is really about like the oppression of people over their darker skin tone, right? So like even when you were having a conversation before, Shauna, you were saying like you were talking to the lighter skinned women who were talking about dealing with their own issues. It's still not colorism. It is prejudice that they deal with, right? Mm -hmm. But specifically colorism does affect darker skinned people. It's just like how Black people can't technically be racist because racism is about a structure that oppresses. Colorism is like a similar thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. colorism is it's mostly, excuse me, it's mostly a one way street. It's it's yeah. mostly like down, you know. And even right. from history, uh, you see, like it's all darker. The lighter you get, the closer you are to whiteness. Is that adjacency to whiteness is really what they're striving for? Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you think this plays in the in the social media world? Because I I think the older that I've gotten, I have appreciated more of uh darker skin. Like when I was younger, I was caught up in the in the whole light skin thing. And now that I'm older and a little more mature, you know, I'm just like, oh, okay, like beauty is, is there, you know, you can see beauty anywhere, but especially with darker skinned people, like I love it. And for people to walk in that kind of confidence now that I feel like mm -hmm. we didn't have as a people, you know, maybe uh, back in the day. But do you think social media uh, plays on that, especially even with the younger generation. Do you think they even see colorism with social media or they just like, they just like who they like? I I, I think the kids are somewhere between like <laughs> completely unaware and hyper cognizant. 
You know what I mean? Like in, in some in some respects, it seems as if, wow, I, hey, I like who I like. And in other respects, it seems like they are acutely aware of some things and and the colorism of it all. And 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 honestly, I applaud a lot of that because I I kind of enjoy, especially when I talk talk to young people, I, I enjoy listening to them talk talk to things or giving me angles that I that I would never think of because I never had those struggles, the same struggles that they had or, or, or the, the upbringing that they have. So I really, I really appreciate that they view things very differently from we, the way we do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that that was like a great point in terms of somewhere between acutely aware and completely like absolved of like whatever is going on, because yeah. I talked to, I was talking about folks in their uh, early 20s, um, like college students and whatnot. And from a social media standpoint, I will say that, especially speaking to younger women, they do share that it's something that they notice. It's something that they pay attention. There are posts about it and pages where they um, almost like impress that upon them in terms of those images and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And so they do speak about colorism from the standpoint of like, the IG model conversation, right? Because they're always talking about how those women that are sought after, lighter skin, long hair, whether it's a weave or not, or a wig or whatever, right. what have you. And so I think, I think social media has, like with everything else, it makes things, it blows things up even more. Um, I don't know if y'all remember a few years ago when we were doing like the light skin men, light skin or dark skinned men um back and forth comparisons. Yeah. Right, right, you right, know, right, I'm right. saying I'm using the, the word men, but you know they weren't using the men word. There was the other N word. And right. It was just kind of like another example of like, damn, we really still we still doing this. Still doing this. We still doing <laughs> yeah. this. You know what I mean? But now we're doing it on social media. So it's definitely still out there. Um I think the only difference that I do appreciate is the opportunity for a more fully breath conversation in total. Right. Because yes, you can see those images. You can also find the conversations that we're having where people are understanding like, oh, this is actually a thing that I need to be aware of because I may be potentially being prejudiced or something or colorist towards people and don't even realize. It. Mm. <laughs> and I think that's the resource we didn't have back in the day. It was a conversation you might have had, but you couldn't like look up examples to really no, like no. see, you, you know what I'm saying? With somebody. You couldn't talk about it. it was right. Like, like like now I can I could have an incident and twenty minutes later be in a in a in a Google Meet or you know Twitter space and have a whole conversation about about that particular incident. That's just not something we had available to us. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Man, I wanna ask you, do, do you think your hair plays into anything as far as like with with uh the way people might view you as far as being a dark skinned man with you know, the long hair, yeah. like. Mm -hmm. It was a very conscious decision when I decided to grow okay. my hair. Yeah. I was, I was like, this is like about to be a thing. I started growing my hair in 2000. My last haircut was 2008. And I remember my mother being like, why are we doing this? You're not even going to be able to get a job. You know what I'm saying? Type yeah. stuff. Yeah. Mind you, I had a full-time job. I had been working full-time. <laughs> um, I got a degree and all of that, but it was definitely a concern of mine. Like when I left higher education and I went to corporate, I had moved down to DC. I didn't know what people were going to say. You know what I'm saying? I was working in different environments. I wasn't sure if people were going to be like, oh, Yo, you got to cut your hair. Cause we were still kind of in that era mm, of right. like, we're not going to hire you if you have a certain type of hairstyle type of thing. Um, and so it's definitely added to a perception for sure negatively in the beginning back in the day but over time and probably because i'm in the dmv as well mm -hmm. it has yeah, yeah. there's a very Absolutely. different like appreciation mm -hmm. for, the dmv you see cops with dreads <laughs> you know what i'm saying that's what i'm saying so it's like it's a little different in that respect but when i was in a, an area that had fewer black people yeah it was definitely it was absolutely a thing yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Michael, I wanted to ask you about what inspired. Can you can you talk to us about the podcast? Because you know yeah, it, it kind of works together, right, with what we're discussing. So, can you tell us about what inspired you 
to come up uh, with your podcast. Wow. Um, so I had this homie, he, Dan, Dan Felton. Uh, he was a, he was a white guy. He had a dope, his dope podcast. And one day he did an episode on the Tulsa massacre and it was amazing. Like, yo, I was like, yo, this is dope. This is really dope. I want to create something. This is, and I was still doing the cut at the time. And mm. I was like, I want to do something similar to this, but I also felt like it was weird to have a white guy tell our stories and no, no disrespect to him. Yeah. Because I think he did a wonderful, I think he did a wonderful job. There was no, I didn't have any problem with what, you know, what he had done. I just felt like these stories are better served coming from us. And this kind of lends itself a little bit to the whole Kendrick and Drake, Kendrick and Drake uh, thing and the whole DJ Vlad thing, because the black experience um, is better when it's told from somebody who's, who lived it. You know, like I didn't, I didn't go through the civil rights movement, <laughs> but I understand, I understand that. I, I understand the struggle. I understand what they went through. I understand what it means to be black. I understand what it means that, you know, have dreads. I had dreads at one point like that. Those things, they matter. And I wanted to have these stories be told from somebody that 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 looks like us. Mm -hmm. And I think they're better that way. So I decided I was going to create <laughs> a history podcast based around that idea. And I really didn't have any idea. I didn't know what I was doing. I still remember me and my blue snowball trying to, trying to come up with a script and talking to the mic and sounding terrible and sounding like I'm reading. And, you know, I had to, I had to get my, my thousand, my thousand steps in and my thousand hours, you know, and, and get better and get better and get better and make it, make it feel easier. And it's been, it's been a really fun ride. I, I enjoy every, every moment of it, of like just telling these stories and, and talking to people about it, especially moments like this when people ask about it and I can kind of talk about, talk about these stories or what kind of inspires me to, to, to make that content. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Because I, I, like I said, I've been a long time listener and I was just like, Hey, you, you tell it in such a, like a cool way yeah. to, to make, make you know, the listener want to stay engaged. Yeah, I try yeah. to keep it short too. I I do mm -hmm. distinctly remember I did a Du Bois episode really really early on, and it was like fifty minutes, and I was like, "That's never again. That's never happening again. I'm not doing no 50, 50 minute uh, episodes." And granted, some of some of do have a tendency to get a little longer. I try to keep it at least under under thirty minutes, um, just because I think that's a long, that's you know really tough on the listener, because I'm uh, especially when you're talking about groups like the Southern Christian Leadership Conference or the NAACP who did a lot. Mm -hmm. it's, I'm throwing a lot of information to people and it's just, it's tough for you to just like info dump on somebody. <laughs> and then you got to listen to this for 30 minutes. And at the end it's like, all right, bye. That's, that's a yeah. lot. It's, it's a, it's a whole lot. <laughs> at least it's a lot. It's a lot for me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, for sure. Definitely uh, appreciate both of you brothers' time. Thank you so much for uh, taking some time to discuss this topic. I wanted to get some minds on here who, uh, you know, just from men's perspective, just minds who who didn't come from just like uh, just this one specific way of thinking. You know, I wanted a That's right. broad, broad way of thinking. So, Matt, let everyone know how they can find you online. I'll have everything linked up in the description, but uh, let everyone know how they can get in touch with you. Sure, no problem, man. Thank you again for the opportunity. And Micah, it's a pleasure. Pleasure to meet you. I'm nah, definitely gonna check out that podcast. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thank um you, man. and yeah, no problem, brother. Um, and then yeah, you can find me on uh social media, King Midas C H, King Midas C H, um, and on most of the platforms. And again, I am just here to talk about pop culture, to talk about relationships and uh, anything else. So again, Sean, thanks. I appreciate it, man. Oh yeah, for sure, man. We did some stuff back maybe during COVID. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was a while ago. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Are you still going? And that's what's the blessing, right? Oh yeah, for sure, man. I'm gonna have to bring you back again. We're gonna wanna talk some more. Uh Michael, let everyone know how they can get in touch with you, how they can find the podcast, all the other good stuff. All right. Um, yeah, you can find me at uh, one Um, that's uh 
my platform where you where I link up all my episodes, YouTube videos. You can find all that. If you just want to talk to me, I'm on Threads at One Mike History, uh, on One Mike underscore History, Instagram, on Twitter uh, at um at One Mike History. Man, if you just reach out to me, talk to me. I enjoy talking about history, but I like talking about everything. So you know, I'm a I try to be a, a well rounded person. You know, like I tell people, you know, I'm like, hey, I like I I like history. But I don't always want to talk about history. <laughs> <laughs> mix it up a little bit for you. Gotcha. Yeah, mix it up a little bit. Let's talk about, you know, X-Men 97. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's talk about X-Men 97. Oh, wait, that's a different podcast episode. That, that is a different podcast. Because <laughs> X-Men 97 is... Yeah, we could, we could turn that into a whole episode, right? <laughs> yeah.